We're in the final days of the 2020 presidential campaign and the closing argument begins and ends with the economy. Remember the dire predictions of what would happen if Donald Trump were to win the presidency? Remember what he said way back on election day? Quote, it really does now look like President Donald J. Trump and markets are plunging. When might we expect them to recover? A first pass answer is never. Well, a funny thing happened on the way to the depression. I think the economy is doing absolutely great. And it's particularly reaching into populations that heretofore have had very bad problems in terms of jobs, employment, and the opportunities that come with full employment. So African-American unemployment is at its lowest level. I give uh, President Trump, and I've said this before on Squawk Box, I give President a lot of credit for moving the economy in a positive direction that's benefiting a, a, a large number of Americans. Historically low unemployment for blacks, historically low unemployment for Asians, historically low unemployment for Hispanics. Tough to beat that, and that's the economy. Now, what about foreign policy? Remember the dire predictions by John Kerry, Obama's Secretary of State? You can't do a peace deal with the Arab states without involving the Palestinians. Remember that? There will be no separate peace between Israel and the Arab world. I want to make that very clear to all of you. I've heard several prominent politicians in Israel sometimes saying, well, the Arab world's in a different place now. We just have to reach out to them and we can work some things with the Arab world and we'll deal with the Palestinians. No, 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 and no. I can tell you that reaffirmed even in the last week as I have talked to leaders of the Arab community. There will be no advance and separate peace with the Arab world without the Palestinian process and Palestinian peace. Everybody needs to understand that. That is a hard reality. Oops! <laughs> Playing out hours after history was made at the White House today. Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain together at a signing ceremony celebrating the Abraham Accords the deal normalizing relations between the countries. The Palestinians calling the deal a betrayal, rockets fired from Gaza. And here's our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, tonight. On the White House South Lawn, before a packed crowd, many not wearing a mask, history was indeed made today. We'll sign a treaty of peace, diplomatic relations, and full normalization. Israel's prime minister and the foreign ministers from Bahrain and the UAE joining President Trump to officially normalize diplomatic relations with Israel, the first Arab countries to do so in decades. And the president moved the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Remember the predictions? New fallout from President Trump's move to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and ultimately move the U.S. embassy there. The president called the dramatic break from the past a step toward peace, but it is drawing a fierce reaction in the region and condemnation from a chorus of world leaders. Our chief global affairs anchor Martha Reddits in Washington with all the latest. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, George. Outside of Israeli support, there has been condemnation of President Trump's move across the globe, from the Arab world to European leaders who've called it regrettable, unhelpful. And Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas said the announcement could lead to wars that never end and shows that the U.S. can no longer be an honest broker in the peace process. And on the West Bank, you see there, there have been protests this morning with Israeli police firing tear gas into a crowd. But so so far, the protests have been relatively small. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in Vienna this morning is calling the president's move just a recognition of reality since Israel has most of its government offices in Jerusalem, George. Yeah, and one of the questions, will the protests escalate tomorrow? And at the heart of this are competing claims over the status of Jerusalem and what this means for the peace process. Exactly. It's been assumed that if a two-state solution was ever agreed upon, East Jerusalem, which is majority Arab, would be the Palestinian capital and West would be for the Israelis. But President Trump's announcement changes that, putting the U.S. clearly on the side of the Israelis, claiming it all, George. And he got us out of that asinine Iran deal. Even Chuck Schumer at one time opposed that deal on the grounds that he gave Iran a march toward getting a nuclear weapon. She's gotten us out of the Paris climate change deal that would have done nothing to improve the planet, but would have done a lot to hurt our economy. And I haven't even talked about Hunter Biden. But the whole lock him up 
uh, false conspiracy theories against the Bidens really is stunning. I mean, he could be talking about the economy and making false claims about that, but, you know, blame it on COVID. He could be talking about a Supreme Court nominee who is popular with his base and what they've done with the courts, yet he's going after, you know, these Rudy Giuliani created, you know, false plots that we now have learned uh, could well be tied to Russian intelligence because Giuliani was wittingly or unwittingly meeting with Russian intelligence agents, people who've been designated by the U.S. government as such. These right-wingers think at Wall Street Journal editorial page, think they can lie through their teeth and talk about Facebook having problems and Twitter having problems with a story mm -hmm. that even the New York Post knew was a lie. They knew it was such a lie. We'll get to this, but that, okay. That they put a woman's name on the story reportedly that didn't even know her name was going to be on the story. The man who wrote that story knew it was such a lie. The New York Post knew it was such a lie that he refused to put his name on that story. Well, Mika, one thing to state right at the top, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani was not fed passively Russian disinformation. He ordered it off the menu. He demanded it be brought to him. Why do I say that, Mika? Because in July of 2019, when in that famous phone call between Donald Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine, most people focus on the shakedown, military equipment, military. No, a big part of that conversation was that Trump said to the Ukrainians, I'm sending Rudy. You've got to talk to Rudy. In December of 2019, Rudy Giuliani goes to Kiev. He meets with Andrei Durkash, a known Russian intelligence asset. They meet to do what? Giuliani admitted to get, quote unquote, dirt on Joe Biden. And then, of course, in August of this year, August of 2020, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the key counterintelligence lead, Bill Evanina, puts out a statement that says that Andrei Durkash, the Ukrainian lawmaker with ties to Russian intelligence, is trying to interfere in the 2020 election to denigrate Joe Biden, to benefit Donald Trump. And then in September of this year, Donald Trump's own Treasury Department puts out a statement saying Durkash is an intelligence operative. So now along comes Rudy Giuliani, says, oh, I've got the disinformation. And Durkash actually made a statement in Ukraine this week that says there's more where that came from. So this looks like Russian intelligence. This walks like Russian intelligence. This sounds like Russian intelligence. Every intelligence professional I've been talking to, Mika, says this is a Russian intelligence disinformation campaign. This is exactly what I said I would stop when I became the director of national intelligence, and that's people using the intelligence community to leverage some political narrative. And in this case, apparently Chairman Schiff w wants anything against his preferred political candidate to be deemed as not real and is using the intelligence community or attempting to use the intelligence community to say there's nothing to see here. Um, don't drag the intelligence community into this. Hunter Biden's laptop is not part of some Russian disinformation campaign, and I think it's clear that the American people know that. This brings us, of course, to the coronavirus. Over 220,000 Americans have died under President Trump's watch. But you're blaming that on President Trump, really? China lied consistently about the coronavirus, about when they first learned about it, about whether there was human-to-human -human transmission, and those lies were parroted by the World Health Organization. You're blaming President Trump for that? And remember the advice that Dr. Fauci gave as late as March 8th about his skepticism about masks? Right now in the United States, people should not be walking around with masks. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better and it might even block a, a droplet. But when you think masks, you should think of healthcare providers needing them and people who are ill. And when Trump restricted travel to China on January 30, how did Joe Biden respond? In a tweet, he accused the president of engaging in hysterical xenophobia. Recall Donald Trump instinctively did not want to shut the economy down. Got hammered. Well, guess what? Now the World Health Organization's special COVID-19 envoy says, shutdowns, bad idea. And now a petition that has been signed by tens of thousands of scientists and other healthcare professionals are saying lockdowns, bad idea. Recall what the Swedish epidemiologist said early on. He thought it was a bad idea. We've had a rather soft attitude in this country to the control of the pandemic. 
uh, doing more by asking people to behave than by writing ordinances and laws and policing. The effect is quite similar to other countries though. If you go out on the central Stockholm at nine o'clock on Saturday evening, you'll be quite alone because people are isolating themselves in their own homes. They do it because they understand why they should do it to protect themselves and to protect other people. Countries that are opening up slowly now will have their deaths that Sweden already had. Uh, when the virus starts spreading a bit more than it has now, the people that if they were, had been Swedes, they would be die, dead now, but they will die in the future. That's one. The other is that statistics and public statistics is a very difficult area. And we were wondering, there was, I was actually a radio journalist who found out, why does Belgium has twice as many deaths as the Netherlands, which they is what they, they publish? Well, that's because the Belgium counts cases from old people's homes, institutions where old people live, whereas the Netherlands does not. Uh, Italy only counts cases that come into hospital and die, not the ones that die outside the hospital. Uh, there are problems with the US figures as well, so statistics is a difficult area. Closing a big problem, especially for Sweden where almost everyone is working outside the home. It would be different in a country with a lot of housewives or house husbands. Uh, there are one million children between ages zero and ten in Sweden and they need someone to look after them. If you close the kindergartens and you close the schools, uh, someone has to be home and take care of them. And you'd lose about 400,000 people in the workforce, many of them working in the healthcare sector. Uh, I have a friend who is a, a nurse head of an emergency department, and she says she wakes up every morning praying that the government won't close down the schools because then she loses half the workforce immediately. On race relations, the president has been hammered because of his alleged rhetoric to dog whistles. And exhibit A for the president's racism, of course, is his alleged statement that there were very fine people on both sides referring to Aryan brothers and Nazis in Charlottesville. And of course, he was not doing anything of the sort. He was talking about the issue of whether or not there ought to be a Confederate monument in public square. He said there were very fine people on both sides of that debate. I got a question. Why wasn't Obama accused of fomenting racism and hatred when he consistently criticized the police to the point where a lot of people sincerely believe that the police are engaging in systemic racism against blacks, even though there is zero evidence for that proposition. And in the latter part of Obama's second term, cops were executed, large measure, because of this assertion that blacks were being killed by the police just because they're black. Two cops were killed in New York, three killed in Baton Rouge, five killed in Dallas, all of whom were killed by three different black men, all of whom motivated by this lie. Police departments around the country are telling their personnel to be extra vigilant this morning after the killing of two officers in New York City. Officers Rafael Ramos and Wen Jen Liu were shot execution style Saturday in their patrol car. On the eve of this convention, the country has been shaken by another deadly act of violence. Six law enforcement officers were shot this morning in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Three are dead. Another is in critical condition tonight. They were ambushed by a gunman that the police identify as a black ex-Marine from Kansas City. President Obama is cutting short his overseas visit with NATO and European leaders to visit Dallas early next week in the wake of the deadliest day for law enforcement since 9-11. Five officers were killed by a sniper during a protest on Thursday. And look at Chicago. Year to year, a 50 percent increase in homicides. How do you blame that on Trump? Cops are pulling back. They fear being called racist. Bad guys know that. And of course, you have the coronavirus shut in, all of which has conspired to make Chicago murder rate 50 percent higher than it was the year before. Where's Black Lives Matter? Are you going to blame Trump on this? Chicago has a black mayor. Chicago's police chief is black. City Council, almost all Democrat. How are you, how are you going to blame this on Trump? Now, a lot of suburban women don't like President Trump because of his style. And they think Joe Biden is a kinder, gentler guy. Joe Biden is a guy who publicly twice lied about the man who struck and killed his first wife and his young daughter. 
the man was a truck driver. And when the accident was investigated, the investigator found that the driver was not drunk, not on alcohol. If anything, the culprit, unfortunately, was Biden's first wife. Yet Biden twice publicly said that the man who struck and killed his wife was drunk. The man was already racked with remorse. The man's daughter contacted Joe Biden and said, please stop saying this. And Biden essentially said he would stop saying it and then said it again. Who does that? if he's nice and warm and empathetic the way Joe Biden is. So please, knock it off. Let me tell you what you're gonna get if Joe Biden wins, especially if the Democrats take control of the Senate. $15 minimum wage, slam dunk. Legalizing the alleged 11 million, I think it's closer to 20 million illegal aliens, done. Getting rid of the filibuster so they can get rid of the electoral college, done a commission to study reparations? Absolutely. Raising taxes on rich people? You got it. College free, debt free, all these cockamamie programs that people like Bernie Sanders and the squad will push Joe Biden to do? Done. Back into the Iran deal, back into the climate change deal. When all is said and done, you're gonna work a lot harder and make a lot less money. That's what you can expect under a Biden-Harris administration, which will soon be a Harris administration because that man is not gonna last very long. I'm Larry Elder, you know what to do. We've got a country to save. I'll see you next time.